We'll wait for some time to allow all participants to join in. Till then, let me run you through some couple of housekeeping checks. If you can hear me clearly, I request you to please type yes in the ch chat box window. I repeat, if you can hear me clearly, I request you to please type yes in the chat box window. Okay. I got a couple of positive responses. That means I'm audible. Throughout our presentation, uh, we encourage you to interact with our speakers by typing in your questions and comments using the questions pane. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in our Q&A section, which is after the presentation. So first of all, on behalf of Harbinger Systems, a warm welcome to all of you and good morning and good afternoon. I'm Sushant Saraswat, Marketing Executive at Harbinger Systems and your host for today. I'm pleased to welcome you for today's webinar, Role of Unity 3D in Free-to-Play Gaming Arena. Let me give you a brief bio about our speaker for today's session, Priyam Kamitkar project lead at Harbinger Systems. Priyank, with almost seven years of experience in design and development of enterprise systems across multiple domains like gamification, advertisements, travel, energy, and business intelligence. He is our in-house domain expert for gamification and has worked on multitude of challenging projects with technologies ranging from Unity 3D, ASP.NET, Objective-C, Java, C, Hash, Google App Engine, and many more. Phew. Okay. So before I hand over the presentation to Priyank, I want to run some interesting facts about the F2P gaming industry. A recent study conducted by Swar a game development studio tracked the habits of around 10 million players on 30 games across its network. They found that only 2.2% of those players ever spent money. That means roughly 220,000 and this spending of monetized players wasn't spread evenly. 46% of revenue came from just 10% of that growth. Thus, further narrowing down our pool of uh, monetized players to 22,000. In that study, it was mentioned uh, looks like there is a technical issue. I would pause for now and get back to it. Just give us few minutes. Sorry for the delay, there was a technical snag, we have fixed it. I'll run, as I was there before, 
I want to run some interesting facts about the F2P gaming industry. A recent study conducted by Swerve, a gaming development studio, tracked the habits of its around 10 million players on its 30 games across the network. They found that only 2.2% of those players ever spend money. And the spending of multiplayer players wasn't spread evenly. More than 46% of the revenue came from just 10% of the group. Further narrowing it down, like just 22,000. Also, In 2014, the in-app purchase revenue was projected to cross $14 billion, which hit the number and is continually growing. Judging from these facts, we can safely say uh, we, that retention and monetization are two of the biggest challenges for any f 2 free to play gaming developer. To guide us through this landscape in more detail, I hand over the presentation to Priya. Thanks, Susan. Thing is, Arena. It's not free to play game. And the concept behind it, we need to first go go back and go back in history and understand the evolution of. Gaming, gaming revenue distribution models. So we'll be covering five revenue models here, and we'll take over and see how the, those differentiate and which of them are recently been used. After the once we have a brief look at the distribution, what you need to 3D and how it in delivering free-to-play games. in-app purchases and how it supplies or delivers virtual store in your game and supporting major app stores for in-app purchase using Unity 3D and few best practices related to it. Followed by, we will be talking about analytics and to understand how analytics work, the guidelines for it, the process and how, how Unity 3D can be used and what all things are available uh, in Unity 3D for integrating analytics into your game. Later, we will be having a look on the advertisements part of the game and few of the ad networks which have been serving in the gaming industry. Concluding the seminar or the presentation with with a losing side, we will be covering here the dark part of the free-to-play games and how to avoid them and getting on the right track. Last but not the least, we will be having a short questionnaire and that's it. Okay, so starting with the evolution of gaming revenue and distribution models. The video game industry has gone through five different models. Those are arcade, retail, digital distribution, subscription, and virtual goods. Before we dive into them, two, observ two observations demand attention. First, different models are by no means mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. For example, people will spend money on their arcade games as well as on the consoles. Similarly, users may buy a game on a mobile phone and perfectly also sign up for, say, MMO games too. So this is the distinction that we need to keep in mind that all these models go hand in hand. So let's go ahead and have a look at these revenue models. First, we have the arcade model, also known as the coin up model. Charging people a quarter of time was the first revenue model 
for the video game industry. Simple it may have seemed, but it was quite complex. Here, there was a fixed percentage behind every arcade game sold for the distributor as well as the in-house you know, gaming studio. The idea was, behind it was top top five percent of every win would get, would deliver a free game for next play. For example, if you are playing a game and you have beat it, you have you are scored a top in the top five list, you will be de delivered a free game. And in this way, you kept on playing, and the enthusiasm was there. So this was the entire revenue model, and a quarter was charged for every game. Pretty simple enough. But but delivering such kind of machine required high development cost. It was not only the game development that was being done here. Here, complex machines need to be built with algorithms behind it, running it, running them with customized controls exclusive for the game and to enhance the gameplay. So you can see there was pretty much a high development cost behind it. Not only that, but these machines were heavy enough and they need quite a maintenance. They need to be emptied regularly and also need to be kept in a working condition. What happened during this arcade evolution was you could see game parlors having various kinds of machines placed in a single place and people used to come here and play these games. So mostly most of them, most of you must be familiar with this arcade model. This was the traditional model, it's still there but people are avoiding this and more into more, more and more getting into the digital part and also the mobile part. Let's go ahead and have the next model with us. So the next model is the retail model, also known as the traditional retail model. This the retail model is largely hardware driven model. The revenue model was pretty simple. The gaming industry was accepting a loss over the hardware and profit over the software. Industry was trying to come up with a solution where they could provide consoles with high configuration, but were ready. To, but when the numbers hit, they found out that creating high high end consoles cost money and it might be possible that consumers won't be able to pay such a hefty amount of money. So they, they agreed on coming up with a mo model in such a way that they would accept a loss on the hardware but they would eventually earn profit from their software that would be sold in the retail market. So this case retailers a few pros over it. Retailers like Walmart, GameSpot, you name it, all had an entire section of games to be showcased in their malls and customers would directly come here and buy the game. This gave them an influence over the distribution system. The retailers demanded a hefty amount or the cut behind every game. This, uh, this could be a percentage from 20% to 40% depending upon the game that it is being served. Also, this, this required a tritely organized inventory by the retailers causing a problem for the developers to deliver game and on time. Whenever you need, the studios used to sign up with retailers, they, they need to commit for, on a timeline that when the game would be delivered and also the retail, retailers since having direct contact with the consumers would negotiate on the time when would be given the, the showcase part of the mall. Like showcasing the game was a, was a big part which generated revenue for the game. So they had a big influence over the revenue distribution. So this was the retail market. Going ahead, we have the digital distribution. You see, digital distribution existed from a long time now, but there was a look at it. Major gaming studios had tried to sell their games digitally, but had failed at the start. It was not that people were not interested or were not comfortable enough to download the games directly over the internet. But the early failures was because of the lack of bandwidth and the network. Later, in the mid 2020s, you can say, the, the network and the infrastructure improved and then the digital distribution came into boom. 
major console server providers started hosting their own services. Name it like PlayStation Market, Xbox Live. All came up, Nintendo Wii, Stream, all came up with their own store and selling digital content online. So this was the digital market. Here, the, the, the distributors were selling same game at the price of the retailer, minus the retail level, the retailers cut out of it. So it was a win-win situation for the digital distribution model and most, most, uh, mostly accepted by the industry. This also led to the rise of indie, independent game developers. The indies had a great chance as a, to deliver most of their games over this distribution, over popular distributions and earn revenue out of it. The next distribution system is the subscription based model. The subscription based model is simple enough. Many gaming companies want that curve want their exclusive games to be paid by exclusive gamers on a monthly basis or in, on a day-to-day -day basis. To avail the service online, the online avail, to avail this online service, gamers need to pay a monthly subscription amount to the gaming studio. This was mainly the, the rise of the subscription model was because of the MMO online gaming real uh, role-playing games that went online led this subscription model to pinch in. So that's it, that's the subscription model. It's been widely adapted in the PC market and console market. It's soon to be seen in the mobile market. Google has recently come up with a subscription model. There's no, not, there's no such model for the iOS part, but yeah, it's pitching in. Yeah, but it's widely accepted over the PC and console market. Last but not the least, we have the virtual goods mark revenue model. Here, within the game, goods are to be sold we have a virtual item that's been sold or a currency. Buying these, buying the currency or item enhances or enables the game. It's simple enough, but it's widely accepted on the mobile part. Many games, are, most of the games have been using this and it's, it's generating a lot of revenue in mobile size of the part. So this was the evolution of the gaming revenue and distribution models. Please note that the later three go hand in hand and you might see games using all these three types of distribution used in, the, in today's day. Going ahead, today we'll be seeing how Unity 3D can help us delivering free-to-play games. So here's a short introduction about the Unity 3D. Unity 3D is a global game industry, leading global game industry software. They have 45% of the market share being the late, it is the newly introduced gaming engine, but it has already captured 45% of the market share. Giving it a, I think it's the, it's the number one market uh, gaming engine that's been used by the market. Almost half of the developers have been registered to Unity 3D and they are using Unity 3D game engine for development of games and deliver free to play games. It has almost 600 million gamers who are using this engine for playing their games. I would say the rapid game development was the key point for using Unity 3D and its acceptance worldwide. It supports both 2D and 3D game development and has extensive multi-platform support. You name it, be it any mobile platform, be it iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Blackberry, it has it. Neither does it, it also has a web, web part where web publishing can be done and your game can directly publish on the website. So that led the Unity 3D to rise and it's been accepted widely. Going ahead, we'll be looking into the in-app purchases, which is a crucial part in delivering free-to-play games. So what are in-app purchases? In-app purchases is a part where, with, with using which, you can embed a store inside your app. Be it virtual goods, you can, you can sell a store, you can sell whatever you like. Depending upon your games, games and the need. Suppose it's a racing game, you can sell your cars in it. People would are ready to pay for 
to proceed. You can even sell levels into it. It's, it, it just enhances the game as you go and also sometimes enables it too. So if you see free to play games, they weren't possible without, without delivering advertisements. If you are delivering a free to play game and, uh, and have an intention of earning a revenue, it's not possible without, without in-app purchases or advertisements. Free to play games without advertisement is simply not possible and, this, and if you are integrating in-app purchases, that's the only way to earn a revenue. So all success goes to in-app purchases for delivering free to play games without advertisements. It's the sole backbone of revenue for free to play games without the ads. So here, so we, we, we seen in-app purchases, you, you, are, you are all set to go, you can sell all your virtual items and goods or you can also sell your virtual currency into it, great. So how can Unity 3D help you? You are, you are done, you, you are implemented your game, you are, you are almost there and now you are started with the in-app purchases. So how it, it can help? So there are basically two ways to implement in-app purchases in Unity 3D. One is the hard way and one is the easy way. Before going into two, these two ways, first we need to understand the core of Unity 3D to deliver in-app purchases. Unity 3D supports native call component. So when I'm saying native call component, the part here is since in-app purchases are bound to your app stores, there is a part where you need to call the native components as which are were developed in native application language and exposed for use in Unity 3D. So that's why Unity 3D has introduced a native call, component call which can be used here. Then the later comes the asset bundles. Asset bundles are the part where you can bundle a set of package or asset, be it be it the artwork out of it, the media, or be it the, any virtual good, for example, you can package your car into it, export it as an asset using asset bundles, and store it in your on your web server somewhere on your in the cloud. Or you can directly embed them within your game and later just enable them once the in-app purchase has been completed. So asset bundles play an important role here. These, as I said, you can also store these assets on your server and can be later downloaded in, within your game. So th this is what's all about asset bundles. So let's see how the hardware would be of implementing in-app purchases in Unity 3D. First comes the native code. As I said, if you are delivering in-app purchases, you are bound, to, bound with the app stores. You need to configure your, you need to go into your iTunes account or any similar account and configure all your in-app purchases and the required things that the configurations has to be done. Then comes the development part, that too on the native side. When I say native, for example, if you are delivering your game on iOS, you need to develop your native side of the code in Objective-C or Swift line. So what needs to be developed here? Here, access to app stores, for example, getting product information or, or details of a specific product, then handling purchases, returns, invoices, you name it, all needs to be de developed and it, it needs to be handled within your native, native code. Once you're done with implementation of the, of the communication between your, uh, your native language and your app store, comes the part of exposing these methods. These methods needs to be exposed to the Unity 3D. Please mind, while developing this, the native part, one needs high, high expertise in the, in the native language as well as in Unity's language, be it C sharp or other. Once you have exposed these methods to Unity for access, then comes the part within your game. You need to do the Unity, Unity 3D's C sharp development or Unity script or Bool language, you need to code in there and call these exposed methods for, make, for supporting in-app purchases mechanisms. Again, this requires a high expertise 
and things can go wrong here. There's a lot of trial and error basis that happens over in this part of the code. That's why I call it the hard way. It gives you a bit flexibility over developing a developing your in-app purchase mechanisms mechanics. But yeah, it's a hard way. It's a lot of coding. First, you need to do the native side, then expose them, and again do the C sharp part, Unity side of the code. That's good, Priyank. I see that on the slide you have mentioned it specifically that this is the hard way. Right. I'm assuming the reason you have done it because the next part would be describing the easier way to do it. Because I certainly, like many of our attendees today, would be interested in knowing how one can accomplish this task in an easier way and achieve the same output. Right, Sushant. That's definitely an easy way. So let's go over the easy way. So if you if you go over the what I mentioned in the hard way, there's a lot of a part to be deal with the native side of the application. So why is this necessary? If you think it should be simple enough, so we can create our own framework and do it. But why reinvent the wheel? Unity 3D has an excellent way of delivering ready-made frameworks by developers which can be used worldwide by other developers. So plugins come into rescue. In this case, Prime 31. It's a beautiful plugin for implementing in-app purchases in your game. It already has all the required native components and development required within the plugin. And you don't need to write any code related to native, native development side for handling in-app purchases. All you need to do is just download the plugin and import it within your game. Once you are done importing the framework and attaching to your game scene, and that means that's the configuration part. When that is done, all you need to do is the C sharp development side, or I would say the Unity development side. That is for supporting in-app purchase mechanism. That's it. Mostly 70% of your work is already done by the by the plugin that you have downloaded. This is good, Priyan. This certainly would save my time. I, since I would not need to implement a code for maybe or integrate it with my game for like let's say I'm building a cross-platform game. Now because of this plugin I would not need not code it again for every, uh, every platform, platform available. Exactly. I can just simply install the plugin and uh, hear the sweet sounding bells of cash registers ringing. Huh? Right. That's the sweet part of asset stores and there are various plugins. Prime 31 is one of them. It's been used widely by most of the developers and it's doing really great. So that was all about in-app purchases. Let's go ahead and see how analytics help us deliver free-to-play games. So firstly, how analytics work? The mechanism is really simple. You, 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 you integrate one of the analytics provided by one of the provider, for example, Google or Unity, integrate into your game, and all you need to do is log as many analytics as you can. For example, you can log what's your user gender, who is playing the game, what's his age, what type of games he's playing. You can you can ask him ask for a survey. You just name it. You can do what all you can. Once you have the input, once you have all the details with you. Just communicate with your server to save this information. That's how simple analytics work. So how would it help in increasing my retention rate? The retention rate has been always been worried the developers a lot. What I have heard, it's from 1% to 2.2% for, for every game. It's a very slow, low number. So if you, if you want to understand your own game, where you are lacking, and what's the problem that's making my retention rate go down, you definitely need the analytics part of it. Configure the analytics in your, in your game, and it would help you understand what's going wrong in your game. For example, there might be a bug in the game that didn't come in the beta or the alpha part of the release. But it's there, and it's troubling the users in the production release. So here, you can log or, and save this information on your analytics server 
and understand, okay, my users are getting stuck in the level 3 part of the game. I need to definitely rerun the level 3 and check what's going wrong there. So this helps. Delivering a quick update over the game could solve the issue. Then there are also various other kinds of uh, other parts where analytics help. For example, if you are working on a, a series of games where you are delivering the first title and later, later next year you might be delivering the next title. Analytics help here too. You can understand your players well that which levels they, they loved the most, which levels were played most of the times and were rerun. So these kinds of analytics can be stored, can be gathered and sent to our server and beautiful reports can be seen to understand your own game. So that's how analytics help increase your retention rate and in other ways too. So there are two ways for using analytics in Unity 3D. One is the Unity Analytics and the second is Google Analytics. Google Analytics is mostly famous for the website. They have also delivered one for the gaming part too. So let's see how to integrate these two in your game to deliver better analytics. Let's start with the Unity Analytics. As I mentioned with the plugin, it's as same, the process is similar enough. All you need to do is download and import the package within your game. Once you're done importing the package, just start the player session with a single line of code that can be done. Just configure with your key that has been configured on the web and you start using that key. Once your player, player session is started, just attach the object to your game object. That means just creating an instance in your game, in your scene. And that's it. Start monetizing, start tracking. You can track whatever you like. For example, the monetization is part of it. You can you can log which of which in-app purchase good or the virtual good is being sold the most. So that can be done. There are various other custom events that can also be delivered. Like exam like I earlier mentioned, what's the age of the gamer that is that of the player that is playing the game? Once you have been, you have logged all these analytics, beautiful demographics are being delivered in, on your website and you can see these reports to understand your game better. So this is how Unity Analytics works. Similar way is been done with the Google site too. You need to install the plugin from, again from the asset store. Just read, go to the asset store, search for Google Analytics, download the plugin, configure it and start implementing it. It's, the process is similar to what I have described just now in Unity Analytics. Just implement it and as per your usage, just configure it, track as much as you can, log it, log as much as you can and that's it. You will see the result on the website of it and you can understand your game better. I would highly recommend to implement analytics in your game. It helps a lot. Most of the gaming studios and developers totally miss out this part and are stuck with the, pro with the problem for not understanding their game and they don't understand why their user base is going down. So do integrate analytics in your game. It would help a lot. That's a handy plugin. I for one did not know uh, that analytics could be used to, apart from web or apps. Now with this, gaming studios can definitely utilize these insights they gain from analytics plugin to create a game which is liked by their users and also in turn increase their chances for monetization. Right. Speaking of which, let's talk about ad networks. Sure. Let's go ahead and talk, talk about ad networks. In-app purchases are great, but to have an improved revenue, you definitely need advertisements. So let us go over various ad networks that are serving advertisements related to game and who have, say, plugins which are configurable and easily integrable, easily integrated in Unity 3. So here, here's the list. First, we have the Google's own ad network called the AdMob. It does have the Unity 3D plugin. It has a good fill rate and the CPM is good. Then we have Apple's ad network. This is exclusive for iOS devices only. It doesn't have any plugin, but Unity 3D has exposed or allowed the developers to use this network using the 
in our in-game component called the add banner view. Then we have various other ad networks like app next, start app, tab join. These two have a very good fill rate and the CPM is quite good. Last but not the least, we have Unity Ads. It is the recently launched ad network by in-house, that's by Unity 3D itself, and its revenue, the, the CPM is the highest in today's market related to gaming. Plus, they, mean, they say that their fill rate is also good enough. So let's go over and see how Unity 3D helps in generating revenue for your free-to-play games. So Unity 3D ad network serves great user experience, opt-in and rewards, opt-in rewards. For example, they mostly serve video ads during a gameplay. So user is engaged while watching the video as well as he earns something. Like when we say opt-in rewards, like if you are playing Crossy Words, Crossy Roads, if you watch the advertisement served by Unity 3D Ad Network, you would earn few coins that will later help you enhance the game that you are playing. So this is was the primary UCP by Unity 3D, and they are doing a really good job. The CPM is also really great. They claim that it has the highest CPM and the fill rate. So that's a boon for developers as well as the gaming studios. They target only games. Only game advertisements have been targeted by this ad network. Again, as, the, as I said, they deliver only quality-rich media ads. These are the video ads that basically get served here. Since they are delivering video ads, they are engaging within, with players with video. So the result is, you have the target players who you need to engage, and before installing the game, you are engaging with the user itself. And the result is, users with high retention and high average response, average revenue per user. So that's a big boon, big plus for your revenue system. I would highly, highly recommend use of Unity 3D Ad Network in your gaming, in your free-to-play game. So advertisements are good. It, it helps a lot with the revenue. But there's also a, a dark side for this entire free-to-play game. So let us, let us have a look at what's the dark side and how you can avoid it. I call it the losing side. So advertisements. Firstly, I would like to ask, do gamers click on ads? I would simply bluntly say, no, they don't click on the ads. Even if they do, it's by mistake or they were not, it was not intentionally. Let's suppose even they are interested in the ad and they are installing the, they want to play the new game. So, so what, what, if they are not clicking on the ad, so there's a result out of it. That's a lot of revenue. If users are, if the players are not clicking on the ads, how will you earn? That's one problem. And the second problem is, if they do click, you're losing your customer. Players are going into the next game and they would stop playing your own game and be interested in the next game. The retention rate again goes down here. That's really bad for your revenue. And it's the developer or the gaming studio whose game is over. So that this is the, the dark reality of advertisements. And it lets the developers end up in the losing side. So you would say, what's, how to avoid this? How to stop being a loser and being a winner? Solution, you would say in-app purchases. In-app purchases do deliver a revenue, but yeah, ads, advertisements are worth. Those, those are annoying, and again, you're, lo you're losing your customers. So what you can say is, just deliver an in-app purchase to stop ads. But again, this is only a one-time payment. You're losing your revenue. We need a more revenue-friendly solution. I would say, that can be done only by in-game non-clickable ads. Brand as many as many things as you can. Brand products, brand places, brand whatever you can. That's the core idea behind it. If you can see within the images, 
many games do deliver advertisements within their game. Those are not clickable. They are just proper advertisements, like the one we see on the television. So these, these deliver, it's, it's a boon to your revenue. You do earn from these advertisements. Plus, it never hampers your gameplay. The user is not annoyed, and it helps a lot. So that was it. This is the part that I would suggest that to recap, to, to go through a recap for entire part for delivering free to play games, I would suggest sell as many goods as you can in an innovative way of course. Deliver advertisements, deliver ads, use Unity ad network. It's, it's doing really good. Developers are earning lots of revenue out of it. And last but not the least, make sure you try to brand as much brands in your, in your game, with, game within. This, this helps a lot. It's good for the revenue as well as your game. Well, that was a great session. Thank you, Priya. I'm sure the audience too is pleased with such a rich and insightful session. We will be taking questions from the audience now. I remind you once again that if you have any queries, please type into the questions pane. If due to time constraints we are unable to cover your question in today's session, we will definitely send you a Q&A document covering answers to all your questions which are raised today. So till we receive further questions, I have a list prepared my, by my team. This is a question from Jeff. He says this question is related to advertisements and games. Okay. So Priya, you mentioned Unity Ad Network server video ads in your game. How often are users interested in clicking, viewing such types of ads? Or do publishers earn high revenue if dependent solely on Unity 3D Ad Network? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the question. Yes, definitely developers do earn from the ad Unity Ad Network. They claim they have, they, have, they have the highest CPM and the fill rate. So that's sure that you are, you are earning. Uh, recently I read, in past two days I, I suppose, I'm not sure, Crossy Road earned more than a million within a week by serving only video ads served by Unity Ad Network. So as you can see, when you are serving an ad from Unity Ad Network, those are video ads those engaged users. And the thing happen is, it's, it, these are short videos and people, the gamer also benefits from viewing these video ads. For example, again taking the Crossy Road example, if users, if I'm a gamer and I'm stuck within the game and I need to buy something, I just, I'm given an option to view the video of an of a advertisement of the next happening game. And in return, you would create few points in your account. Isn't that great? That really helps. That, that was the major plus point for Crossy Roads for serving Unity ads and they are earning a lot. The revenue is really good. I suppose this answers your question. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. This is from Ron. He says he's soon to be launching a game and He's quite impressed that, and for him it seems that the in-game advertisement suits, uh, would suit his game best. Mm -hmm. So the question is, does Unity Ad Network serve in-game advertisements like you mentioned here? Mm -hmm. And are there any other ad networks worth mentioning? Thanks, Ron. Thanks for the question. Yes, you, it's quite interesting, the in-game advertisements is quite interesting. And Google and Apple don't serve such kind of campaigns. Not that I am aware of. But yeah, if you would say in-game advertisements, what advertisements are being served by Unity Ad Network is a kind of in-game advertisement. Like the, the user is running a video. But in return, he's earning some, some coins or something. Again, even if the user tries when the video is finished, even if the user clicks on the advertisement and is interested in installing the game, he never uh, goes away from the from your currently playing game. 
the entire installation happens in background. So that's again a one plus point of using Unity Ad Network. But if you're not happy with this kind of approach, there are a few other ad networks too who, who provide only in-game advertisements, like the ones we saw in the previous slides, where banners and posters can be applied in, within your game. Uh, let me recall, one was Rapid Fire and uh, there was another which was launched recently enough, was Greedy Game, I guess, Greedy Game Media or something. Just Google it, I'm sure you will be able to find it. Again, let, let me repeat that for you, Rapid Fire and Greedy Game Media. These are the two ad networks. I think they are only serving in-game advertisements and nothing else. And they have a very good revenue for their developers too, their publishers too. I hope that answers everything. Hey, thanks, Priyan. I hope Ron has got what he was looking for. And Ron, we would like to wish you all the best in your gaming venture. Best of luck, Ron. Okay. We have another question from Mike. He's asking, does app stores support the subscription model for in mobile gaming? Hey Mike. Subscription model. It's a tricky model. You are asking your users to play, pay a nominal amount for, for a day or a month. Yeah. So does app stores support it? I would say yes as well as no. Google Play supports it, but App Store doesn't. Many of them get confused that App Store does provide in-app subscription, but that's not true. That is only available for newsstands kind of applications where you're selling content and not game. So App Store doesn't support it. I'm not sure about the Windows Store. Google Play definitely supports it. Uh, you can go ahead and check in-app subscription Google Play and you will be able to find all the details regarding the subscription model that you can use in your game. In your game. So I, I guess that answers. Okay. Okay, my team says that I have time for one more question. And so I'll take this one. Does Unity 3D support publishing of game on the web? And there's an, another second part to the question that if yes, then does Unity uses WebGL or a custom plugin? Okay, that's an interesting question. WebGL is pretty new, but yeah, web web publish publishing is definitely supported by Unity 3D. They come up. It's uh, in pre before Unity 5. It was delivered using a plugin called Unity Web Player, and using that player, use, users players, gamers, whatever you call them, are able to play the game on a website and that's it. You just need to install the one-time plugin and they are able to play the game. Recently, they are trying to hit the WebGL platform too and uh, they have uh, showcased games running on WebGL. I'm not sure if Unity 5 is out and uh, WebGL publishing has been delivered. But yeah, they, they definitely have plans for supporting WebGL too. Okay. Thank you, Priyan. Thank you for answering all the questions. I would like to request if you still, if there are still any queries, please type in the questions pane. Or you can also mail us at hsplinfo at harbingergroup.com. So with this, we conclude today's session. And we would, since the webinar is being recorded, Everyone will receive an email with a link to view, view a recording of the event along with the Q&A document. So I would like to make a request. Please fill in a short feedback survey that will pop on your screens when you, once you exit the webinar. It won't take long but will surely provide us important insights on how to improve and what topics to choose from in the future. With this, we conclude today's session. Once again, Thank you all for joining us and have a great day.